Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Cimolino. I'm the artistic director of the Stratford Festival. And today we're talking about Pericles, our 2015 film version that was directed by Scott Wentworth. And I have with me today the pleasure of being with two extraordinary Shakespeare scholars, Sir Stanley Wells, who is the honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. He's a prolific writer. He's also the editor of both The Penguin and the Oxford Shakespeare's. And along with him, Paul Edmondson, an extraordinary scholar, a writer, a poet, a priest in the Church of England. I'm not sure there's anything he doesn't do. And these gentlemen have a book coming out this September called All the Sonnets of Shakespeare. Welcome to you both. Thank Hello. you, Anthony. Lovely Great pleasure to be here. Thank you. I just wish we were in Stratford itself, but we're in the other Stratford. Yes, well... <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, you're, you're stationed in Stratford, England. I'm here in Stratford, Ontario. And at this time with the pandemic, we're oceans, greater than oceans apart, aren't we? Tell me about all the sonnets of Shakespeare. I, I, it's coming out in September. We were hoping to have a book launch or a celebration yeah. in Stratford, Ontario. With us. We were hoping to be there with you. Yes. And so what is the book about, Stanley? The book is a collection of all the sonnets of Shakespeare, as its title implies. There's a bit of a surprise in the title, though, because it doesn't just include the usual sonnets, the sonnets printed in 1609. It includes all the passages in sonnet form from Shakespeare's plays. Shakespeare wrote in sonnet form, especially early in his career. Famously, for example, the first meeting of Romeo and Juliet is in the form of a sonnet. The prologue to Romeo and Juliet is in Love's Labour's Lost. The lords uh, write sonnets, some of them in praise of their ladies. So Shakespeare found the sonnet form invaluable, both as a private med meditation and also as, as a form for speeches in the plays. Our book collects all these sonnets. It introduces them with a historical introduction, critical introduction. Every sonnet has uh, some notes. Uh, they're printed in chronological order, and this again is very original, because every other edition of the sonnets that we know of before now has, has printed the sonnets in the order in which they were printed in the 69 quarto. We print them in the conjectural, it is conjectural, order in which Shakespeare wrote them, which I think is very illuminating. And every sonnet has a paraphrase at the back of them, because some of the sonnets are very difficult poems, and we feel that these paraphrases will help the reader by giving them a prose paraphrase of every poem. Uh, we're proud of what the book is going to look like too. Cambridge University Press are publishing it. They tell us it, it, it will have beautiful end papers and it will have a gold ribbon. <laughs> we'd, we'd like to hear about the gold ribbon. So it's going to be a handsome and not very expensive book. Either. So we're delighted by, by the way the publishers have treated it too. Has Paul got anything to add on that, I wonder? Only to say that Judy Dench and Stephen Greenblatt and Caroline Duffy and Gregory Doran have all said nice things about it so far. <laughs> On the cover. <laughs> you need some help picking up those names, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get my hands on it, gold ribbon and all. Paul and Stanley, Pericles, even among the yeah. Shakespeare canon, an extraordinary play written, we think, in 1609. It was not included in the first folio, but we know because it was printed five times in quartos within 30 years, it was hugely popular in Shakespeare's time. It's a bit of a messy story. It's a big story. It covers a lot of ground. Do either of you want to maybe take us very quickly through the plot of Pericles? Anthony, you mentioned the sea a few moments ago and how it keeps us all apart. The sea is really part of the story of this extraordinary play. It was one of the most popular plays in Shakespeare's period. And, and I think the first thing to say about it is that it's about travels, it's about families that break up, it's about uh, families which, who are reunited. And uh, Pericles starts in quest at the beginning of the play and tries to solve a riddle the riddle of Antiochus and his nameless daughter. And he realizes that the riddle is about incest. And he's the first, apparently, of many people who've tried to solve the riddle. The others have all lost their heads, which we see on stage. And then from there, we go on to these series of strange encounters of Pericles on his travels. He escapes from having solved the riddle because his life's in danger. And he encounters Dionysa and Cleon are the first whom he encounters there. Their kingdom is suffering a famine. Then he goes on from there to meet King Simonides and his daughter Thaisa, whom he ends up marrying. 
and she gives birth to their daughter at sea and she dies apparently in childbirth and the daughter is safe who's named Marina because she's been born at sea and Thaisa is put into a coffin and sent out into the ocean and she's washed ashore and she's brought back to life because she's not really dead by Saramon and she takes refuge in a temple of Diana. Meanwhile, Marina grows up in the court of Crayon and Dionysa, and there are problems there because she's more popular than their own daughter, and Queen Dionysa plots to have her murdered. And she is a great persuader, Marina, and she is able to persuade the murderer not to kill her, and then she's suddenly abducted by pirates who take her to a brothel, where she persuades people not to have sex with her. And then eventually she is reunited with her long lost father. And eventually they are both reunited with their long lost mother and wife. It's a very moving story. There are many fine speeches and moments in it. And it sounds completely bizarre the way I've just described it. And it is bizarre, isn't it, Stanley? Because it's a romance. Yes, it is a bizarre play. It's a romance play. The very word romance means an improbable story. There are two interesting things I want to mention about it. One is that Shakespeare had already told the basic story in the Comedy of Errors. Early in his career, he used this story of Apollonius of Tyre and combined it with the comedy of mistaken identity, mistaken twins, in the Comedy of Errors. That was written somewhere around about probably 1594. And then some 15 years later, he collaborates with another obscure writer called George Wilkins uh, on this play. Wilkins was a very odd character, a very bizarre character, a brothel keeper, a vicious anti-feminist. He, he's known to have beaten up women, to have kicked a woman in the belly. He was prosecuted, a pregnant woman. He was prosecuted for that. And it's, it's difficult to tell how Shakespeare came to collaborate this man, but he was also a playwright. He wrote quite a good play, which had been performed by the King's Men, by Shakespeare's company, before he and Shakespeare collaborated on Pericles. The players come down to us in a very garbled form in what's known as a bad quarto. So editors have to do a good deal of reconstructing to make it a fully coherent dramatic text, which is partly why it's not performed as often as it frequently is. And therefore it also gives directors a certain amount of freedom, of textual freedom in what they do with the play. I've seen this Stratford production on video, greatly enjoyed it, and Rand admired the way that the director handled the problems of, of the text in making a fully coherent narrative out of this uh, garbled text. Mm. Thank you, uh, Stanley and Paul. It has a very dark beginning, as you said, working with Wilkins, who probably wrote the first two acts, they, they believe. Yes. Of, uh, why do you think the beginning is so dark with the incest and it's quite a point of departure for a story that eventually has a happy ending? Well, that's true. Of course, the incest beginning is not the real beginning of the play because no one's mentioned Gower yet. John Gower begins the play, which is, which is a really important aspect of Pericles. And John Gower is the medieval poet who was in the court of Richard II and he was most famous for writing a poem called Confessio Amantis in 1393. Uh, he was a contemporary of Chaucer. And in putting him on stage, we're evoking a medieval world. Now in the Stratford production, and any production of this remarkable play has got to decide what to do with John Gower. In the Stratford production, Gower becomes Diane a votress and her fellow nuns, a sort of deity figure who we then see interacting with human events, which is masterly because it's Gower presents scenes. We then see what follows after what he said will follow. Sometimes it contradicts what he follows, but he's the structural underpinning of the drama. And in the Stratford production, that seems to be much more about divine interaction as well as about the, the, the poetic of the narrative itself and we, we start with the with the with the incest I suppose as a dark place because we're moving more and more into light it feels like a very archetypal play in, in some ways um, and of course it's the requirements of the of the source story. When you talk about the medieval elements in Gower it keeps coming up within the text the jousting for instance so finding a uniformity to the text is either something that directors can choose to do or play up the the contrasts 
Stanley, in terms of the, that, the, the shipwreck, he discovers the armor that his father has left him and then goes in Pentapolis, goes into the contest for Thaisa's hand. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the conventions that might have been there at the time, how we'd understand that kind of scene in that its time? Well, it, it, it draws on, on conventions of jousting, doesn't it, of the tournaments which were held at Elizabeth's and King James's court, when Elizabeth's great courtiers, like the Earl of Essex, for example, would take part in tournaments, so that Shakespeare was appealing to uh, contemporary interests and concerns, as well as drawing on, on medieval conventions, which, of course, the tournaments themselves draw on. So it's in, interesting in, in that way as, as a, an evocation of courtly activities among the, uh, the, the aristocracy and royal figures of Shakespeare's own time. Well, the play is set in ancient Greece. So could you tell us a little bit about the sensibility of Shakespeare's audience that could be perfectly comfortable with two worlds, at least two worlds at once? It's 69, we believe, it was written or first performed. So it's not the early Shakespearean audience. It's an audience which would have comprised partly ordinary citizens, but also courtiers, Shakespeare's company performed frequently at court uh, and there is a myth I, I think a mistaken idea that the audiences of Shakespeare's time were made up mainly of ignorant folk or, or uneducated people in fact there were some very sophisticated people in those audiences they're aristocratic and well-educated people as we know from many accounts of the time and Pericles was popular at the court of King James the great leading actor of Shakespeare's company Richard Burbage is known to have played Pericles he was the original Romeo the original Hamlet the original Lear and there's a lovely story about how one of the aristocrats who attended the play refused to go and see it in 1619, some years after it was written, because Burbage had just died and he was so moved at the thought of seeing a play in which the very popular actor had successfully appeared that he couldn't bear to see anybody else play the role. So it, it's a rather Beautiful. touching story. Mm -hmm. Paul, any thoughts on that? Well, just to say that um, the medieval aspects of for example, the jousting and King Simonides' court, I think are beautifully handled in Scott Wentworth's production. The design by, by Patrick Clarke takes us into the world of almost like Tenniel's Alice in Wonderland. Right. Um, that, there's a really self-conscious storybook, medieval quality, uh, you know, slightly illuminated manuscript world in that jousting episode. And, and there, of course, that's when Pericles casts eyes on Thaisa and that, that results in their marriage. In Antiochus, the first king we meet and his daughter, we then bump into Simonides and Thaisa, as you've just mentioned. And it's a contrast in kings and princesses, isn't it? In this production, Scott has had Deb Hay play all three of the different princesses, right to, through to Marina, and Wayne Best plays Simonides and Antiochus. Your thoughts on what that did in terms of our comprehension and how you enjoyed that? Well, I love the tripling of the nameless daughter of Antiochus, Marina, and Thaisa. And it was a bit of a mystery to me because I kept thinking, well, how are we then going to cope with Thaisa at the end when she's reunited with her daughter? Like if you were to double, for example, Perdita and Hermione in The Winter's Tale. And of course, the production casts uh, another actor as Thaisa, who's aged, because we've moved on quite a few years from when, Ta from when Marina was a baby to when she's reunited with her mother. So it makes total sense in the context of the production. And I think I remember rightly that Thaisa is played by the person who plays Diana as well, or Diane. So there's that deity aspect with Adler, the, the yes. mother. Yeah, right. yeah it's be beautifully done that. I admire the way that the production is, uses a, a, suggestions of Victorian setting and costume, which distances it to some degree from our own time, creating a rather stylized atmosphere uh, and helping to emphasize the romantic aspects of the play, the improbable. It's rather Dickensian, rather like Alice in Wonderland in some ways in, in, in its visual appearance. And I like that and enjoyed it very much. I was thinking about the Victorian elements and, and wondering whether it's because in those days, 
boat travel was really significant and people relied on it. So it, it makes real the voyages at sea and the shipwrecks and also the handling of the brothel scenes and Marina's virginal virtue sits well with the Victorian period too. Saruman, you mentioned the bringing Thaisa back from what seems to be the dead and has music play at that time, much like Lear coming back from... Yeah, uh, the scene re resembles King Lear a good deal. The, the, the reunion scene, the, the, re the coming to life of, of, of Thais very much resembles the, the scene between Lear and Cordelia in King Lear, of course. This, there are um, strong echoes of other Shakespeare plays in this play, understandable particularly because it comes towards the end of Shakespeare's writing career. He's drawing on conventions, he's drawing on his own past to a considerable extent. Stanley, the sea, which Paul had mentioned, you know, at the end of Lear, it's a movement towards the sea. Time and he's buried at the edge of the, of the sea, the fringe of the sea. And here the sea swallows up, people cast them back, can you talk a little bit about the sea in Shakespeare's imagination? Yes, it, the sea figures a good deal. It, it's there again, going back early in his career to in, in the Comedy of Errors, where Aegean is, is a traveler. And we hear about he lost his children at sea and eventually finds them again. What other plays are there where the sea is so important? Yes, Leah. Twelfth Night, Twelfth Night, or What You Will with the Shipwreck. Yes, in, in Twelfth Night, again, we get the, the Viola starts that play being washed, washed up from shipwreck. These are common elements of what we call the romance convention that the story is deriving from, from these early romance stories. And I think also it, it follows through some of the themes that Stanley's been alluding to in those other plays about the sea and identity and how the sea separates selves and reunites selves and how we, we learn more about ourselves because of the sea. So I think in Pericles, I also see the story of Jonah and the whale and the attempt to resist, as it were, God's will for our lives, running away from what God asks us to do. And then the whale swallows you. <laughs> and, just, and, the, and that sense of Pericles can't escape the fate that is in store for him. Whatever he does, he can't run away from it. And that sense of fate will lay hold on him and Marina will come back and Thaisa will come back to him, whatever, whatever he does. So I think that's there in the story. And we hear Pericles say uh, towards the end, this great sea of joys rushing upon me, which is a beautiful line in a play which has been so much about selves separated by water, this great sea of joys rushing upon me. And in this play, we have a character called Marina who has come out of that sea of joys. And 14 years passed, a, a big gap in the middle of the play, as there is in The Winter's Tale. And then when we come out the other side, we see a young woman. She's grown. And as you were saying, Paul, she's vastly more popular than Cleon and Dionysia's daughter. So then we begin a new plot of trying to kill her. Can we talk to us a little bit about that idea? It's, it sort of echoes the evil queen in Cymbeline as well, doesn't it? Yes. And the evil queen in the story of Snow White, of course. So it's a, fair, it's yes. a fairy tale element. Yeah, that, that's common to all the romance, to the romances, the romance stories. The, the improbable is evoked. And it's evoked partly in order to create a sense of the miraculous when, the impro when what is unlikely to happen actually happens. Uh, and uh, this, this creates a sense of wonder, particularly at the end of the plays, which is re responsible for some of the depth of emotion that these late romances of Shakespeare's uh, evoke in their, in their, so beautifully in their audiences. They go through, the improbability is the very essence of a romance story. It's not likely, but it happens. It's a miracle. And, that, that, and we get a wonderful sense of that, and it's brought out beautifully in, in, the, in this production. You get the miracle of conversion in these plays. You get the miracle of the conversion of the man who comes to the brothel wanting to have sex, wanting to treat Marina as a prostitute, who is converted by her beauty, by her innocence, into admiring her and eventually into wishing to marry her in a pure and noble way. The, the plays deal in extremes. This is part of the whole essence of the romance story. There's both a fantasy to the brothel and a kind of uncomfortable reality, isn't there? Both of those things seem to live together as we go through this journey. 
That's true. Yeah. And when we when we talk of pirates, of course, we should probably think something along the, along the lines of modern day pirates. And yet we also think about pirates from storybooks as well. But modern day pirates are, of course, dealers in in in, in people in human trafficking. They're the they're the modern day slave drivers. I mean, this is this is becoming increasingly prevalent in the UK and it's all over the world. It's 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 a modern day modern day plague, if you like. Uh, people yeah. Um, it's also very apposite to our current situation, isn't it? With families being separated from one another, having to, to exist uh, by, re by remote contact, as it were, the same as we're doing now. The fact that they suffer through their isolation and we hope eventually uh, are brought together again. With a semi-miraculous, these plays are very much involved very much concerned with the improbability and with the overcoming with the improbable overcoming of impossible obstacles time is very important in these places isn't it the effects of time on people like rather almost comically like the effect at the end of the play poor uh, pericles uh, his hair is very long we often sympathize with that uh, in england anyway we're all the barber shops are yes, we're um, having pericles. the same issue there yeah. uh, but, pericles needs a haircut his hair but his hair has been growing for 13 years hope it won't be quite as bad as that for us. Stanley, let me interrupt you for a moment and just take the audience with us here. So the idea of separation, of the effects of time. So Pericles believes Thaisa is dead. He is told that Marina, his daughter, is now dead. He refuses to cut his hair and basically becomes among the dead himself in some ways until yeah. he has the reunion. You've talked a little bit about this, but this is such a fantastic part of this whole genre that we go with this improbable story. And at the end, we are profoundly moved when families come together. Can you both talk a little bit about that? The Pericles reunions are more in slow motion than in the other plays. It's as if we're having them underlined very self-consciously. So when Marina comes in to speak to Pericles, I mean, she doesn't know it's her father at first, of course, but he's in a comatose state. And because of her natural ability to charm people, to persuade people, to heal people, to convert people, a bit like Helen in All's Well That Ends Well, that one of the plays that opened the first season in, in Stratford, Ontario. She's brought into King Pericles to help him. And it's a gradual revelation. And then he asks her to name, well, name your mother for me. And it's as if we need these confirmations, these helps, these aids to take the whole thing in slow motion. And then it happens again when the two of them are reunited with Thaisa in the next scene. Pericles, as it were, cross-questions Thaisa about the, the name of the, of the man who looked after the kingdom while he was away. Oh, it's Helicanus. Oh, and here he is. All of that is also taking place at the same time as the simple human interaction of holding each other and Marina just longing to be, as she says, in, in her mother's bosom again, because she's never known her mother. They were separated from birth. So it's, it's a whole world and identity and I suppose archetype, which is being reunited and given back to people in those moments. Stanley, this story of profound loss of danger, heartbreaking loss, and then reunion and joy, you've touched on some ways that it resembles the world we live in today. What can we take from at this time of pandemic, at this time of, of troubles in societies around the world? What can we take away from this, this great play? Well, I think we can take a sense of hope, a sense that that the obstacles are there, but they are there to be overcome. And that with faith and with love, especially with love, because the play is very much about love, many different sorts of love, but, with, but that love enables people to overcome obstacles that otherwise might conquer them. So, so love, the power of love is explored in this play with the extremes, the extremes of the, the, the abuse of love, in the in the brothel scenes but then the sense of pure family love which of course includes nevertheless the sexual love of, of husband and wife in the final scenes shows it, it gives us a sense that love may overcome the obstacles that uh, are, are placed in front of us by life well let's hope that your words prove prophetic for our world because we certainly need a fair amount of love right now we do yeah 
Sir Stanley Wells, Paul Edmondson, you are both not only fantastic resources and people who have been responsible for so much good work on Shakespeare over many years, you're also, both of you, great gentlemen and great friends, and it's wonderful to, to have you now here with us. And I can't wait to read all the sonnets of Shakespeare. Well, good, and we can't wait to get back to Stratford, Ontario, and to be with you again. We've been there on a number of occasions, and it's always been wonderful. We love Stratford, Ontario. Well, you have an open invitation for 2021. <laughs> now we just need to thank cross you. our fingers. Bless you, Anthony, and bless the festival, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you both. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you.